Okay, hey everybody. Good day to you all. God bless you and welcome to today's study of God's Word. We're going to pick it up with Leviticus chapter 25 today in just a second. It's going to be covering the year of Jubilee, uh, laws concerning redemption of property, and laws concerning slavery. Uh, before we get started, as always, let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Father, I pray that you open eyes, open ears this day, and let us receive the wisdom that you would have us receive from your word. So in Yeshua's precious name, let's get right into it. The book of Leviticus chapter 25, verse 1, and it reads, And the Lord spake unto Moses in Mount Sinai, saying, now this Mount Sinai, this is the Mount of God. Verse 2. Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. And this be talking about the land of Canaan, the promised land. Verse 3. Six years thou shalt sow thy field, and six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard, and gather in the fruit thereof. Verse 4. But in the seventh year shall be a but but in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. Thou shalt neither sow thy field, nor prune thy vineyard. Now, a Sabbath of rest in the Hebrew, this means a Sabbath of Sabbaths. And this is twice for emphasis. Now, if you remember in the book of Genesis, God created the heavens and the earth and also the uh, all of the races in six days. And then he rested on the seventh days, on the seventh day from all of his work, <clears throat> which he had made. Genesis chapter 1, basically the whole chapter, and Genesis chapter 2, verse 2, will document that. Verse 5. That which groweth of its own accord of, the, of thy harvest thou shalt not reap, neither gather the grapes of thy vineyard, of thy, excuse me, of, of thy vine undressed, this means unpruned, for it is a year of rest, unto the land or for the land verse 6 and the sabbath of the land shall be meat for you for thee and for thy servant and for thy maid and for thy hired servant and for thy stranger that sojourneth with thee verse 7 and for thy cattle and for the beasts that are in thy land shall all the increase thereof be meat, or food. Verse 8, And thou shalt number seven, seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years, and the space of seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. Of course, naturally, seven times seven is forty-nine. And remember, in biblical numerics, seven is... Uh, spiritual completeness and so this seven times seven this would be spiritual completeness intensified so 49 would be spiritual completeness intensified verse 9 then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month in the day of atonement shall you make the trumpet sound throughout all your land now this trumpet of jubilee this will be uh, a curved horn, and it would be of a loud or joyful sound. And this seventh month, this tenth day of the seventh month, this would be uh, Tisri, or the equivalent of our month of October. Verse 10. And ye shall hallow, hallow meaning set apart, the fiftieth year, and proclaim liberty throughout all the land and to the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a, ju a jubilee unto you, 
and ye shall return every man unto his possession, and ye shall return every man unto his family. Now you'll see um, in the rest of this chapter that this is talking about that if, if you owned a, a servant, a hired servant or uh, a slave, or yeah, a hired servant, that after 50 years he would be set free unto his family. And you're going to see that uh, in, in the, at the end of this chapter. Verse 11. A jubilee, or let me make a comment. In the 50th year, 50 uh, being Pentecost or 10 times 5, uh, 5 being grace in biblical numerics and 10 being ordinal, ordinal perfection. So you've got ordinal perfection times grace in this number 50. Verse 11. A jubilee shall that 50th year be unto you. Ye shall not sow, neither reap that which groweth of itself in it, in it, meaning in the fiftieth year, nor gather the grapes in it of thy vine undressed, unpruned. Verse 12. For it is the jubilee, it shall be holy unto you. Ye shall eat the increase thereof out of the field. Verse 13. In the year of this jubilee, ye shall return every man unto his possession. Or if, if uh, you purchased uh, someone's land after 50 years, uh, you would have to return it to that person. Verse 14. <clears throat> and if thou sell aught unto thy neighbor, sorry about that. Let me get rid of this phone. That should do it. Sorry about that. <laughs> For, verse 14. And if thou sell aught unto thy neighbor, or buyest aught of thy neighbor's hand, ye shall not oppress one another. And this oppress means overreach. You should not defraud. You should be fair with, with one another. And that's just the natural way that you want to do things. You treat others as you want to be treated. You don't want to defraud your neighbor. It's never going to work out uh, for you. It's always going to catch up with you one way or the other. Because God is always keeping score and he does not miss anything. Verse 15. According to the number of years after the jubilee, thou shalt buy of thy neighbor... And according unto the number of years of the fruits, he shall sell unto thee. Now, this would mean that the price, if it was just a few years after the jubilee, the close, put it this way, the closer that it became to the jubilee year, the price or the, uh, of the yield of the fields would, would go up just a little bit. Uh, every year, just a fraction, because in the 50th year, uh, no one would be able to uh, receive their profits or, or gains from the field, because it would be uh, a year of rest, the Jubilee. <clears throat> 16. According to the multitude of years, thou shalt increase the price thereof, and according to the fewness of years, thou shalt diminish the price of it. For according to the number of years of the fruits doth he sell unto thee. You should do, do accordingly. Price it accordingly. Verse 17. Ye shall not therefore oppress one another or mistreat one another. But thou shalt fear thy God. For I am the Lord your God. Yahweh your Elohim your creator. You, you, you shouldn't oppress, oppress, oppress them trying to in, in a way trying to play God over them. Uh, you should fear or revere, love thy God, and also fear him if you're his enemy uh, because he's the creator and he owns all the souls and you don't have the right to oppress anyone or mistreat anyone because all the souls belong to God. <clears throat> Verse 18. And you're not the judge. Our Heavenly Father is the judge. Verse 18. Wherefore ye shall do my statutes and keep my judgments and do them 
and ye shall dwell in the land in safety. This in safety, this means in confidence, not having to worry. And does this say, ye shall know or be aware of my judgments and my statutes, um, learn them? No. It says, do them. You know, faith without works is, is basically nothing. You, faith without works is, you, you'll make it into heaven by believing upon the Lord Jesus Christ, but if you don't have any works, you're going to be buck naked. Verse 19. And the land shall yield her fruit, and ye shall eat your fill, and dwell therein in safety. If you do things God's way, you're going to be prosperous, and you're, he's going to protect you. Verse 20. And if ye shall say, What shall we eat the seventh year? Remember the seventh year being the year of rest for the field. Behold, we shall not sow nor gather in our increase. What are we gonna what are we gonna do? How are we gonna have profit if we can't gather in our profit from our field? If God commands you to do something, he's already taking care of the details. You can guarantee that. Verse 21. Then I will, God speaking, then I will command my blessing upon you in the sixth year, and it shall bring forth fruit for three years. So there you go. God's already taken care of it. If he commands you to let the field rest in the seventh year, what's he going to do? He's going to let it yield in the sixth year enough for three years. Everything with God is common sense, and he always takes care of the details if you're if you're doing his work and if you are doing what he commands you to do. He's never going to leave you uh, out there to dry. He will always take care of you. It, it may get rough, um, but, you know, true Christians, um, they're, you know, it ain't no step for a stepper. A true Christian, they're not worried when the going gets rough. They know that if they do uh, as much as they're able to do, and give it all their, that they have, then God will pick up, pick it up whenever you run out of strength and take care of it, of everything else. <clears throat> he always does. <clears throat> 22. And you shall sow the eighth year, eight being new beginnings in biblical numerics, and eat yet of old fruit until the ninth year. Remember, you have three years in the sixth year, so you're still eating off of those three years of fruit until the ninth year. Until her fruits come in, ye shall eat of the old store. 23. The land shall not be sold forever. This means uh, permanently or absolutely or beyond recovery. For the land is mine, for ye are strangers and sojourners with me. And God owns everything. And any any land that you own or have a deed to, God is just on loan from our Heavenly Father. Uh, and He's allowing it to be deeded in your name for the time being. But it belongs to Him. Make no mistake about that. 24. And in all the land of your possession, ye shall grant a redemption for the land. 25 this means uh, allow the land to be bought back if you buy any land from someone uh, that's on hard times and they, they want to buy it back allow them or their next of kin to buy it back 25 if thy brother be waxen poor and hath sold away some of his possession and if any of his kin come to redeem it come to buy it back then shall he redeem that which his brother sold. You shall sell it back to his next of kin or his redeemer. And, you know, spiritually, you can even think about this as, as Christ. You know, he is your next of kin. He's your closest relative, our Heavenly Father. You know, and he bought your soul back, I guess, in, in a way. I mean, all souls belong to him anyway, but he paid for the sin of your soul on the cross and if you uh, believe upon him you shall have that eternal life 
and that forgiveness of sin because he paid, he bought, he bought, he paid the price for your sins with his life on the cross. 26. But don't, I, I misspoke earlier. He didn't have to buy back the souls because the souls were never sold. They all belonged to him, but he paid for the sins of the souls. Let me make that clear. 26. And if the man have none to redeem it, if he has no one to buy it back, and himself be able to redeem it, and he's, he's able to buy it back, 27, then let him count the years of the sale thereof, or how many years uh, until from the time he sold it, and restore the overplus unto the man to whom he sold it, that he may return unto his possession." 28. But if he be not able to restore it to him, then that which is sold, the land which is sold, shall remain in the hand of him that hath bought it until the year of Jubilee, until the 50th year. And in the Jubilee it shall go out, and he shall return unto his possession. So after 50 years, if the man or his uh, next of kin has not been not been able to buy back the land that the man sold in the 50th year uh, shall be returned back to him that sold it. 29. And if a man sell a dwelling house in a walled city, then he may redeem it, buy it back, within a whole year after it is sold. Within a full year may he redeem it, may he buy it back. 30. And if it be not redeemed or bought back within the space of a full year, then the house that is in the walled city shall be established forever to him that, that bought it throughout his generations. It shall not go out in the Jubilee. So if a man sells his house in a walled city and isn't able to buy it back within a year or a uh, a day, the days of years, 365 days, then it becomes the persons who purchased it for a possession and to their, their, them and their children forever. It does not go back to the person who sold it in the year of Jubilee, like the land. 31. But the houses of the villages which have no wall round about them shall be counted as the fields of the country. They may be redeemed, and they shall go out shall go out in the jubilee. So, if the house is not in a walled city, then the same uh, rules pertain uh, as if it were just the land. Thirty-two. Notwithstanding the cities of the Levites and the houses of the cities of their possession, may the Levites redeem at any time. Now, this is talking about the cities of the Levites. This is the 48 cities that were uh, set aside or dedicated to the Levites that you can read about in Numbers chapter 35, verses 1 through 8, and Joshua chapter 21, verses 1 through 8. 33. And if a man purchase of the Levites, uh, this, this is a bad translation. This should... This should read, this should read, if one of the Levites should not redeem. So we'll read it that way. Or well, we won't read it that way, but that's what it should read. Then the house that was sold and the city of his possession shall go out in the year of Jubilee. For the houses of the cities of the Levites are their possession among the children of Israel. 34. But the field of the suburbs of the cities, of their cities, the Levite cities, may not be sold. They're not even allowed to sell it. For it is their perpetual possession. It is theirs forever. 35. And if thy brother be waxen poor, subject change here, and fallen in decay, uh, this fallen in decay, this means have become shaky or feeble with with thee then thou shalt 
relieve him, yea, though he be a stranger or a sojourner, that he may live with thee or live beside thee. If, if somebody's fallen on hard times, um, then you should help them out as best as you can and allow them to uh, live beside you or live with you until they get back on their feet. 37, or excuse me, 36. Take thou no usury of him, or don't charge him interest if you loan him money, or increase, and don't charge him interest on any goods that you, that you loan him. But fear thy God, thy creator, thy Elohim, that thy brother may live with thee. 37. Thou shalt not give him thy money upon usury. Don't charge any interest if you loan him money. Nor lend him thy victuals for increase. And don't charge him increase if you give him any food or any provisions. 38. I am the Lord your God, Yahweh your Elohim, Yahweh your Creator, which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be your God. He's, he's, you know, this is the compassion of our Heavenly Father, and he's, he's setting these laws forth and reminding them, you know, you were bondmen and not in such a great state yourself in Egypt, and I delivered you out of Egypt. So don't forget where you came from. And when when you've when you're doing well and you see a neighbor fall on hard times, uh, don't don't lord it over him or don't try to make a profit off of him if you give him a loan. Because you yourself were on hard times in Egypt. Don't forget that. <clears throat> 39. And if thy brother that dwelleth by thee be waxen poor, and be sold unto thee, thou shalt not compel him to serve as a bondservant. You should not treat him like a slave. You should treat him, well, we'll just let God say it. Verse 40. But as an hired servant... <clears throat> and as a sojourner, he shall be with thee, and shall serve thee unto the year of Jubilee. You should not treat him as a slave, but treat him as an hired servant. And he'll serve with you until the 50th year, 41. And then shall he depart from thee, both he and his children with him, and shall return unto his own family, and unto the possession of his fathers shall he return. Now, Remember what I was talking about back in verse 10. This is, this is what I was talking about. 42. For they are my servants, which I brought forth out of the land of Egypt. They shall not be sold as bondsmen, as slaves. God's saying, if they're anyone's slaves, they're my slaves. They shall not be sold as slaves, only as hired servants. And, beloved, it is a it is an, a, an absolute joy and pleasure to be a slave and a bondman of the living God. I mean, there's no better place that you could be but in His hands. Believe that. Not because I'm saying it. Believe it because it's the truth. <clears throat> 43. Thou shalt not rule over him with rigor or with severity, but shall fear thy God. 44. Both thy bondmen and thy bondsmaids, which thou shalt have, shall be of the heathen that are round about you. Of them shall you buy bondsmen and bondsmaid. If you're going to have a slave, it's going to be of the heathen. 45. Moreover, of the children of the strangers that do sojourn among you, of them shall ye buy, and of their families that are with you, which they begat in your land, and they shall be your possession. Those will be your slaves, but not a fellow, excuse me, not a fellow Israelite. 46. And ye shall take them as an inheritance for your children after you, to inherit them for a possession. They shall be your bondmen forever or your slaves forever. But over your brethren, the children of Israel, ye shall not rule one 
over another with rigor, with severity. You should not treat uh, the children of Israel as a slave. 47. And if a sojourner or stranger wax rich by thee, and thy brother that dwelleth by him wax poor, and sell himself unto the stranger or sojourner by thee, or to the stock of the stranger's family, 48, after that he is sold, he may be redeemed again or bought back again. One of his brethren may redeem him, may buy him back. 49. Either his uncle or his uncle's son may redeem him, or any that is nigh of kin unto him of his family may redeem him, or if he be able, he may redeem himself. He may buy himself, he may buy himself back out of bondage. 50. And he shall reckon with him that bought him for the year that he was sold to him unto the year of Jubilee. And the price of his sale shall be according unto the number of years, according to the time of an hired servant, shall it be with him. So an hired servant would be paid for or uh, reckoned in years, and you would reckon this uh, just like the land is reckoned for how many years until the next jubilee, and the price would be changed accordingly. 51. If there be yet many years behind, according unto them he shall give again the price of his redemption out of the money that he was bought for. So if there is uh, a lot of years until the Jubilee remaining, basically on his contract of, uh, of servitude, then he sh he, the, the price that he would be bought back would be uh, whatever he was, he, whatever the, the person who bought him paid for him instead of uh, paying the amount if there's a lot of years until the next jubilee, instead of paying for all of those years, which would be much more than what he was bought for. 52. And if there remain but a few years unto the year of jubilee, then he shall count with him, and according to his years shall he give him again the price of his redemption. So if there's only a few years left until the jubilee, then... To his price of his redemption would be based off of however many years, uh, whatever the fee is for a year, times however many years toward to the Jubilee would be the price of his redemption. 53. And as a yearly hired servant shall he be with him, and the other shall not rule with rigor over him in thy sight. So if you if you see uh, your, your brother and a fellow Israelite being a servant to... Um, the heathen or, or a stranger, you need to make sure that that, that stranger is not ruling over him with uh, vigor or um, severely in your sight. You know, if you don't have any knowledge of it, then there's nothing you can do about it, but you, you don't allow it to happen in your sight. 54. And if he be not redeemed in these years, if he isn't bought back in these, these years, then he shall go out in the year of Jubilee, in the fiftieth year, both he and his children with him. 55. For unto me the children of Israel are servants, God speaking. They are my servants, whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And that's going to conclude chapter 25. And as I was saying, the best place you can be and is in God's will, and that is being a servant to the living God. How do you serve Him? Well, God gives many different gifts to different people. And, you know, your gift could be just uh, having a, a smile, you know, to cheer someone up. Um, that That's a gift from God. Uh, someone else's gift could be uh, a gift of uh, being able to practice medicine. You know, and, and help uh, people with their physical health. Others have a gift of teaching. You know, whatever your gift is that God gives you, um, you know, you, you need to use it and serve Him with it. Because that's how you get blessings. You know, our Heavenly Father owns everything. 
and he created your very soul. And either you're going to serve him and do things God's way and receive his blessings, or you're not. You're going to exclude him from your life and let your Bible collect dust on the shelf. And you're going to end up receiving God's cursing. So it's it's basically up to you. You know, uh, he foretells us all things in his word. And what's especially important is that you pick it up and read it. Why? Because in this final generation, you need to understand what's written in God's word so that you're not deceived by Satan who is coming at the sixth trump with his fallen angels. They're coming He's coming to play little Jesus boy on the earth, and God's going to allow him for a short time. And if you're not aware of what's written in God's word, and you don't know any better, whenever he shows up, Satan that is, and he puts a chicken in every pot, pays off all your credit, and says all you got to do is, is worship me. You know, I'm Jesus Christ. Here I am to fly you out of here. And he's going to be working miracles, and everybody's going to love it. They're going to think he's Christ. And the only people that are not going to worship him are the ones that study God's word and the, the ones that are written in the book of life from the foundations of the world. Um, you know, our Heavenly Father is good to us. And he's, you know, as you can see in this book of Leviticus, he brought the children up out of the land of Egypt. And he's not just, you know, saying, okay, then for yourself, figure it out. He's telling them, you know, this is what I expect. This is how you're going to do things if you want to be blessed and prosper. And he's taking care of them. Um, he's preparing them to go into the promised land and, you know, not just throwing them in there and saying, okay, there's your land. See you later. God's not like that. He's telling them what he expects of them, how to do things, so they'll be able to continue to prosper and to be blessed. You know, not so they're just wandering around, you know, waiting on his next instruction he's, he's written it all in here all the instructions are in here have you read it is the question if you haven't you're missing out and it, it is really an awesome thing to partake of the word of god and to gain that wisdom and to realize just how uh insignificant uh we really are in in these flesh bodies you know um, and if, if your, your place of significance comes when you start serving God and doing things his way and receiving his blessings. I mean, when you pick up his, his love letter that he wrote to you and you read it and you study it, especially in this generation when it seems like no one cares about our father, not too many folks care about our father. I, I certainly do. But when you do that, it gets his attention and it pleases him and blessings are going to follow you're going to start to see your life change for the better and you're going to be blessed and people are going to start to notice it and the, the best thing is is that you get to have that truth and that peace of mind during this final generation which is exceptionally wicked <clears throat> if I might add you still get to have that peace of mind and, and, and get to be blessed and you know, even when you go through hard times and rough spots, you still have that peace of mind because God tells you how to deal with all those things and you know that he's on the throne and he's in control and that as long as you do your best and you serve him and then when you fall short, you repent, you're in good standing and, you know, there's no better place than you can be than in good standing with our Heavenly Father. Um, he's able to bless you, protect you, and to bless those around you. So pick up his word, you know, do, do some work on your own. Read it, read it. It is, it is the love letter that is just full of, of, of blessings and, and his wisdom. I mean, to ignore it is just, it, it just blows my mind. Um, if you want salvation, you want eternal life, and you want to be blessed, picking up God's word and studying it and uh, praying to him, talking to him and serving him is how, how you get that. And it's, it's easy, you know, as long as you try your best and repent when you fall short, God counts that as perfect. I mean, you can't ask for a more loving and, and awesome uh, father than what we have. And it's a privilege to serve him 
And I love him and I love you all too. All right, don't miss the next lecture. Thank you for watching.